Hey everyone, thanks for coming back for part three of the art, architecture, and purpose of effective dialogue beyond he said, she said. I'm Jay Kenner, and this is the third and final part of three-part series. Last week, we talked about the nitty-gritty of what makes dialogue good or bad. Now we're going to dive more into the nuts and the bolts of how to get that dialogue onto your page. I like to think of writing like acting for non-actors. Especially when you're writing dialogue, you want to get into the character. You need to do that anyway when you're writing in a character's point of view. You need to mentally be that character. Otherwise, how can you express on the page what that character is doing and feeling with realism? So how do you do that? Well, you put your fingers to the computer or the paper and you just let yourself go. Remember that you can fix it later, but right now you're wanting to essentially channel your character. Before you do that though, you need to set the scene. Think about the point of what you are writing, of that particular point in your story, that scene, that plot point, that entire sequence. Say, Jamie and Freddie are going to rob a convenience store, but it turns out that Jamie is really setting Freddie up and the clerk is in on it with her. Well, that's going to inform Jamie's dialogue and the clerk's and possibly Freddie's. Lay out the steps of the scene, then think about how you can show, not tell, through the dialogue. Then get into those characters and let yourself go with your first draft. Remember, that's what editing is for to fix everything and go deeper and cleaner. That, of course, raises the question of how you edit the dialogue. Eventually, if you haven't already, you're going to develop an ear for dialogue. You're going to know when it sounds right or when it sounds off in your own work and in the work of other authors. But even then, it's good to have a checklist of things to go over, especially when you're new so that you can go through and make sure that your dialogue is as clean and as purposeful as possible. I'm not going to go over everything that's on the slide on the screen, but as you edit your work, one thing you really want to do is read it aloud. That will give you the best sense of how real your dialogue feels. Things you want to think about are, does the dialogue have a purpose? Is it in the scene doing a job? Or is it just hanging about? If it's just hanging about, not being useful, fire it, get rid of it. Put in some dialogue that actually knows how to do some work. Is it on the nose? In other words, does your dialogue have subtext? Remember, we already talked about subtext in that the fact that people very rarely say what they mean exactly. Subtext is something that is a lecture in and of itself, and I will um, either do another video or post a um, written uh, session on subtext on my blog, so be sure and keep an eye out for that. Also, you want to ask yourself, are the characters distinctive? Can you tell who is speaking even if you don't have tags? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Are we moving the action forward with this dialogue, or are we just sitting here in space talking around in circles and not moving your story forward? Is there conflict in the dialogue? Is it entertaining? Does it sound real, but not too real? Remember, we don't want any five-year-olds who talk like teenagers unless we're in a wrinkle in time. Be sure you don't have any bad exposition. We don't want to read Sparks notes that catch us up on the plot. Except in special circumstances, if we've already seen it, we don't need to hear it again. And be sure not to include info dumps that explain the technical stuff. Find a creative way to get that necessary information across. Okay, so now let's address some final additional points. What about multiple speakers? Well, the best thing to do is to use action to indicate which person is talking or to tag the dialogue if you need to, to keep it um, clear who is actually speaking. Remember, ideally, your dialogue is going to be clear without tags because 
the person's voice will be distinct. That's not always the case in fast-paced dialogue, and sometimes you just want it in there for the rhythm and the flow, so you kind of slow down the read. Remember, people don't always speak a person's name when they're talking to them. You're talking to your friend. You're not going to say in every sentence, well, Laura, Laura, what do you think? Laura, should we go to the store? Things like that. So that's you don't want to tag them by having the other person say their name unless it makes sense. It's okay to call someone by a nickname, of course, but when you're tagging dialogue, stick with the name that you've given that person so that you've got one name as opposed to another. That can change throughout the story, though. I have a series where the heroine thinks of him as Stark in the beginning because it's a very formal relationship. They're not intimate yet. She's still uncomfortable with him. But then later, she calls him Damien. Also, don't tell too much in the dialogue. Remember, one of the best ways to keep readers turning pages is to have story questions. So you don't want to answer all those story questions in your dialogue if you don't have to. Take a look at this section of dialogue that's on the screen. It's from one of the Jack Reacher books by Lee Child. I recommend them all. They're amazing. We have no idea why Jack Reacher's not owning up to who he is when he's being in questioned. But we want to. We don't need to, though. We want to. And that's going to keep us turning the pages. Just a quick note about punctuating dialogue. You definitely want to have a copy editor, but you also want to know the basics. I've actually seen a number of published books that do it completely wrong, so you don't want to be one of those people. When you have a quote, if you look at the screen, following the quote before the tag should be a comma, and then she said or he said and then your period. You don't want to end the dialogue and then have she said be a new sentence. That's not the way it works. Now, you might have another sentence after that. It's going to be an awesome day, period, close quote. She looked for Fred to see if he was paying attention to her, period. That's different. You're not tagging the dialogue there. You're just continuing your writing. You have a quote, then you have something, some action. If you're actually tagging the dialogue, then you need to set it off with a comma. Also, when you're writing in dialogue, use commas, periods, or ellipses. Um, and M dashes, those are the longer dashes, to signify like a pause in the dialogue. Inside those quotation marks, I really recommend not using semicolons. Think about the way people speak. They stop, they start, they have long pauses. They don't really talk in semicolons. And limit your explanation, sorry, exclamation points as well. I think it's better to use italics for emphasis, but again, there's there can be too much of a good thing. Your emphasis really should come from the language and the words themselves and the situation. So be sparing with that. Now, a moment ago, I said that you want to use a comma when you're tagging your dialogue as opposed to writing another sentence following the dialogue. But what I didn't say is, except under pretty unusual circumstances, the only tag you're going to want to use is said. Said, 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 said. Said is an invisible word. Some authors, especially newer authors, think that they need to mix it up to make it more exciting. So I've even seen words like ejaculated for someone saying that they were, you know, excited. Oh my God, he ejaculated. That's not what you want to do. You don't need words that seem exciting. What you're doing here is you're tagging the dialogue so that the reader doesn't get lost, but you don't want to draw them out of the story by the use of strange words or words that just aren't invisible. So to sum up, words like gassed, quaked, laughed, those are no-nos. And you don't want to use tags to explain emotional states either. 
What will we do, she said fearfully. Well, it would be much better to use action following the dialogue. What will we do? Icy terror pooled in her stomach. Make your words evocative. Also, I defy you to find a way to smile or laugh dialogue. You have a piece of dialogue that says, you're so funny, comma, close quote, she laughed. Well, try to laugh that line. You can't do it. Or, you're gorgeous, she smiled. You can't smile that line. So you're going to want to say it as, you're gorgeous. She smiled. Now come with me. Something like that. In a lot of ways, the word said really is like a stop sign. You see it, you process it, but other than that, it's really invisible. And that's the way you want it to stay. One of the ways to make sure that you don't have to rely on dialogue tags too much is to make sure that your dialogue is distinctive. Each of your characters should have their own distinct voice so that you can read a page or two of dialogue without tags and know who's speaking. If you are from my generation, you would know that putting in A would be Fonzie or damn it, Jen would be um, Bones on the Star Trek series. But people have rhythms in the way that they talk. They have word choices they use. You want to note through their dialogue whether they're very well educated or perhaps grew up without a significant education. Perhaps, like we talked earlier, their profession colors the way that they speak. All of those things are going to help your reader know who is speaking so that you really only have to tag the dialogue in order to control the flow of the language, the flow of the words on the page, slowing down your reader's um, eye, possibly, or just to keep the reader from being confused for those shorter lines or the back and forth where you just really need to break it up. Related to that flow that I was talking about a moment ago, dialogue needs to look good on the page. It needs to look appealing to your reader who might choose the look inside the book feature. And if they're on their phone and see one giant block of text, they might be turned away. Think of it a bit like social media. People like things to be easy. They want it to have a flow. They want it to be pleasing to the eye. What we've got on the left here is Pride and Prejudice, and on the right, a sample from The Hate You Give. It's not to say that Pride and Prejudice isn't a good book. Of course it is. It's a wonderful book, but it was written in a different era, and you can see how much more appealing to the eye the book on the right is. Modern novels these days tend to read more like a movie. You picture what's happening. So let that guide you in your writing on the page. Let it show up in a way that is pleasing to the eye. And that's all good and well, of course, but what do you do if you do have a long block of dialogue? Well, you can break it up into paragraphs, of course. Um, when you do that, you want to, if you're not using tags, you want to end one paragraph without an end quote and begin the next with a beginning quote. That signals that it's the same speaker just starting a new paragraph. But the way I like to do it that I think is cleaner is to break it up with some action, to really break up that dialogue. So this on the screen, if you don't recognize it, is the opening of the Beverly Hillbillies. It's one long block of text, but if we break it up with some action, the narrator looked at the crowd, and then punch it with that last little bit of dialogue, it's not only breaking it up visually, but it's breaking up the moment and setting up that final beat. And oftentimes you'll find that you could do that in your dialogue. Punch in some action to break up speech. Honestly, that's true even if you're writing nonfiction. There's no prize for wading through a solid block of text. I used to be an attorney, 
And one of my jobs at one point was working on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, writing opinions with one of the federal court judges. And I cannot tell you how much we appreciated when attorneys filed briefs that had those insane blocks of text broken up and how much we would focus on breaking up blocks of text in the opinions that we wrote that were then published in the various um, legal publications for other lawyers to refer to as precedent. You want people who are reading your work to be able to concentrate and pay attention to it. So it makes sense to make it easier for them to read. That applies in fiction and in nonfiction. Dialogue also should have a rhythm. It should have a flow to it, a cadence that's almost musical. That's a harder thing to teach. But when you're reading your work, when you're thinking about it, when you're reading it back, either aloud or in your head, although I do recommend that you read it aloud, especially if you're a new author, you want to think about how it's going to sound to the reader in their head or how the book is going to sound in audio if it becomes an audiobook. How does it sound to your inner ear? You want to vary your sentence lengths. You want to use a few sentence fragments. Sometimes repetition can be bad, but sometimes it can emphasize a point. Punctuation also plays a big part in getting the rhythm right, as do tags, which we already talked about. In copy edits, I change my punctuation a lot because my editors will fix it. Um, but I will go back and fiddle with that punctuation so that I can make sure that I'm forcing the way that the reader hears the words in their head. Aaron Sorkin says, and I wish I had the exact quote for this, but I don't. I can't give you a citation. But he says, I've heard him say that writing is meant to be spoken, and because of that, it should sound like music. I agree, but I say that even nonverbal dialogue, which is really your entire book, needs to have that rhythm and flow. It needs to be pleasing to the ear. Don't use weird words. Dialogue isn't the time to show off your vocabulary, and unless those words fit the character who uses them, then it's going to. Think about how the book is going to sound as it's being read in someone's head or aloud. I've thrown in a few cards there for you to help you think about things like run-ons and tags, um, and how you can use those to manipulate your dialogue so that you tweak your reader's ear, so that you make it sound a bit like music, like something that is meant to be heard. But also keep in mind most importantly that dialogue doesn't in exist in a vacuum. You want your dialogue to drive your story forward. So when you're writing your dialogue, always keep in the forefront of your mind. What is the goal of your scene? And if you don't know the goal of the scene or the goal of that character, then why are they even talking? That's it for this workshop. I hope it was helpful. Feel free to leave your questions on the comments on the YouTube page or on the blog, and I will do my best to answer them. You can also always email me at jkinnerinfo at gmail.com, which is also on my website. And don't hesitate to subscribe to my blog or visit jkinner.com backslash write for writing tips and tricks. Thanks again.